they're not uh, sitting back and taking it easy. They're just keeping on the move, going to the parks, taking Zumba classes, hiking every week, biking, and so forth. So um, I'm, I'm excited to, to be inspired by their journey. My husband and I are, now that COVID is ending, we're, we're wanting to travel some more. So I'm hoping to get some ideas of what we might be doing. So without further ado, uh, Chuck and Donna, you can take it away. Okay, thank you very much, Joanne. And I wanted to thank Pat for being instrumental in getting us on as your presenters and uh, to be part of your a great uh, Zoom meeting today with your group. Um, and also Judd for handling the, the technical details of the photographs that you'll see in a moment. Very good, Judd, thank you. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, the late uh, Bruce Malkin for being initially, uh, he was the one that, that got me and my wife involved in this early on, maybe at the end of last year, early this year. Uh, right. We had a meeting scheduled for February, but that didn't work out. So we're now here in April, but I want to acknowledge the late Bruce Malkin for that. And uh, before we do get into the slides and pictures, I'm, I wanted to uh, say hello to some of my Zoom friends that I see uh, uh, in the video. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. And uh, it's good to see you all again. I uh, wanted to give you some personal background of my journey with per peripheral neuropathy. I was diagnosed in early 2011 with PN initially by a podiatrist who I went to see about numb little toes in each foot. It got worse from there over the years to the point where the feet are 99% numb as far as feeling is concerned. Later on in about 2013, I got several diagnostic tests done, including electric shock, the CMT genetic test, and I believe that's called the Charcot Tooth Marie test and a blood test of various kinds. All were essentially negative. I was prescribed gabapentin at one point at the Hershey Medical Center. I was in no pain, though, at the time, so in retrospect, I really didn't need it. I got off with that after a time because I was suffering some negative side effects. And that's when I started researching supplements. I started with alpha-lipoic acid, but it turned out I didn't take enough at first. I also started benfotamine, or I call it benfotiamine, uh, but later dropped it because it didn't help me at the time. But later on, as you'll hear, it did start to help me. In 2016, I saw the well-known Dr. Hoke at Johns Hopkins. He performed many of the same tests, which I had received earlier, including a bigger and better genetic test. And he also, he also did some uh, skin puncture tests. All the tests were essentially negative. He diagnosed me as having a mild case of idiopathic small fiber peripheral neuropathy. But of course, as everybody, everybody here knows, there's no known cause of that. Uh, Dr. Hoke uh, only told me that someday I would need to, need to use a cane to assist me with walking. By 2020, though, I developed balance issues, which uh, keep me from wading in the rockiest of streams uh, to uh, fly fish. In 2020, I asked Dr. Hoke to test me for Parkinson's disease because I really thought at one point I was getting it but he ruled that out. I have difficulty writing though, and, and that's what led me to ask him for a, uh, uh, a test. Along with my wife, we have taken trips to many Western and Eastern national parks, including a wilderness area in Colorado. And that's the one at 9,500 feet. Uh, I had to push through some of these trips though with pain and some discomfort. Now up to the present day, I experienced some uh, pretty strong burning pain in the right foot toes during several hikes in Yellowstone uh, National Park last June. Before the trip though, I had talked with someone via a Zoom meeting, uh, his, own, his own Zoom meeting, who advocated reducing sugar intake and taking this ben benfotamine, uh, which is a vitamin B1 fat soluble mineral, or I guess a vitamin supplement, uh, daily, along with alpha lipoic acid. I also started uh, a B vitamin complex as well. I, here, here's the thing about my experience. I did experience immediate pain relief in my feet, especially the right foot. 
all and all spontaneous shocks through my feet stop and have not returned to this day. I used to get these jolting shocks through my feet, but no longer anymore. And, and also the weird feeling that I experienced at night upon going to bed also disappeared for the most part. Now I feel fall asleep uh, much more quickly. I'm still suffering from significant to severe muscle cramps, but have also experienced much relief by taking a new magnesium supplement called magnesium esporotate. And I think that'll be shown at the end, I think. That's correct. Okay. Um, I'm having balance issues, as I said, and I do take the yoga classes two days a week that my wife you know, really stresses that I go to, and I do do them. Uh, but I, I, oh, I also suffer from this dreaded PN itch syndrome, which I just read about in the foundation newsletter. I relieve it by taking uh, the, the Zyrtec or a Zyrtec supplement or a Zyrtec uh, 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 brand, generic brand. Substitute, yeah. Substitute, right. So that's my personal story in a nutshell. I'd be happy to answer questions at the end about it. Thank you for your interest and my wife's and my pre uh, uh, wanting to hear my wife's and my presentation today. So we can start with the slides whenever you're ready. Okay. <clears throat> Next slide. Next slide. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, this is uh, one of our first trips uh, after Chuck was di diagnosed. Uh, we went to Acadia National Park and had some pretty hefty hikes there, uh, very rocky. But, you know, we stress using the trekking sticks um, when you're going to go on hikes like that. And the brand of stick we use is Mountain Smith. You can get all kinds, though. Those are inexpensive when you can spend a lot of money on them, but you really don't need to, um, just so they have rubber tips on it so they don't slip and slide. Uh, one, one more thing about Cadillac Mountain. As you can see, I'm all bundled up. It was October of the year, as you can see from the trees, and it was very cold up there and windy, so I had to take steps to you know, protect my feet against the cold. Next slide. This is our trip to Alaska, and we took a helicopter to one of the glaciers um, and explored up there. Again, he, he'll talk about, Chuck will talk about the necessity to keep his feet warm and what he did to do that. And, and again, the, the trekking stick, um, next slide if you want to, the trekking stick is really important on these hikes, especially um, we were hiking a lot of ledges, very narrow, very rocky. Um, this is a particularly treacherous trail uh, up in Alaska. It was very rooty and rocky. I did manage pretty well uh, on this hike. My balance wasn't quite the issue that it is today. Next slide. This was also in Alaska. This was in Fairbanks. This, uh, this was uh, along one of the rivers, and this is one of the, the uh, easier hikes, long but easier. It was on a flat surface. Next slide. I think that's a uh, that's, that's probably, Fairbanks. That's probably the same hike. Okay, next slide. Next, next slide, sorry. Oh, here we go. And again, this is on the glacier. The trekking sticks, like I said, is a, they're important just to have that rubber bottom on them. Some of them have metal on the bottom, but if you're going to be on anything that's slick, like rocks or ice, you're going to need the, uh, the uh, trekking sticks uh, with that tip on it. And I'll stress again the importance of having to keep my feet warm. And I did that through warming pads, you know, toe warmers. And, and yeah, probably the toe warmer was the most important thing. Hmm. Uh, next slide. Uh, this, is a little, <laughs> this is more recently, we, we did a, about a three and a half week trip out west to many of the national parks out there. Um, Badlands being one, very hot trail. Um, hiking to the, the geyser, the Lone Star geyser was an interesting hike, uh, considering I push him uh, a lot to speed up 
his his walking and uh well you can tell well <laughs> we had to walk two and a half miles to see this geyser go off like it is now what we did it in about 40 or 45 minutes because we really walked fast i mean we walked fast and this is where i discovered my toe burning issue was here on this height uh and and i had to really work hard to push through it um but we we got there and we passed people and they said oh the guys are just stopped you missed it but go ahead anyway maybe you can wait for two more hours and it'll go off but we got there and it started up again just like it is here for about 25 or 30 more minutes and that was a little gem that we found and it's hot in badlands on the right i'm bent over because it was so hot that day i didn't want to be in the sun for the picture <laughs> But that, that hike, that Lone Star hike stressed, I think, the importance of when you go on these trips, you really have, it, you just can't just go. You really, for weeks and months before you go, you really should be walking on a regular basis and, and exercising. That's why I love Dr. Hoke. <laughs> yeah. Because he does stress that. I can testify. We can testify to that personally. She went to my first appointment in 2016 and he talked about exercise the, the important of exercise next slide next slide uh, this is still yellow the left is still yellowstone um this was a hike it was a rocky hike we uh, we ended up not going to the very top um chuck didn't went to that day well it was it, it was it was steep and rocky it was uh, so it was a little more treacherous than we thought, however, when we were in Grand Teton on the right, that hike where he's sitting at the top, um, that hike was very steep, very rocky, very treacherous. He was ready to give up, but people that were coming down from the hike were kind of encouraging yeah. and said, no, you got to go now. You're almost there. You got to do it. And I kept encouraging him to do it too. The balance was an issue because it was a very narrow uh, steep climb, rocky, loose, rocky climb. Um, but I, I told him that I, I said, I'm not going to the top of this mountain without you. So <laughs> you got you to gotta keep moving, bud. So he did and made it to the top. So that was like, like a big achievement. It really was. Excellent. Next slide. <clears throat> Colorado. Um, again, at Trapper's Lake more so. Colorado, we did a little bit of, of of hiking, but not as much as in Trapper's Lake. Trapper's Lake is what you were talking about, 9,500. Right, uh, right. That day in Trapper's Lake, that's the 9,500 part. The lake itself is around 93, not to split hairs or anything, but here in this area is probably closer to 9,500. Mm. And I, I had personally no problem with the altitude Yeah. that whole week, we didn't the whole that. few days we were there. And on the left, you'll see Grand Colorado Monument in Grand Junction or near Grand Junction, the heat was an issue that day, so we didn't hike hardly at all. It was 102, 103 Yeah, plus. it was in the low hundreds. Next slide. Yes. Uh, this is Trappers Lake, Colorado. Again, it, yeah, it's in Northwest Colorado, Moffat County, in case it matters. But as you can see, well, they, had, they were destroyed by a fire about 25 years ago, back in the early 90s. Uh, or no, later than that, I think in the early 2000s, but it's still trying to grow back from that devastating fire. Mm. And that's at 9,500 feet again. Next slide. That's uh, Travers Lake again. Yeah. That's just an example of the trail that we were hiking. Yeah, some trails are rocky, some, you know, pretty easy. Uh, next slide. This was uh, Yosemite. This is one of the earlier um, trips that we took. Um, and we did the uh, lower Yosemite trail, which mm -hmm. we, we accomplished, but we tried the upper Yosemite, which turned out to be very steep and rocky. Um, what was nice about the Yosemite trail though, there were landing spots, there were flat rocks. And we, yeah, I think we even ate lunch or had mm -hmm. a snack where yes. you could sit and, and rest um but that was quite a climb up there well worth it when you see the falls the the sunny spot is actually part of the trail uh and also down to the left of the sign of the little uh, writing on the slide that's all that's the trail 
And it, it was really extremely rocky that day. Um, I didn't have any issues uh, that I remember. I do know the big issue I had at Yosemite in general. I discovered that I was wearing shoes that were too small for me. And so I had a problem the whole week with regard to shoes that should have been a size larger. And I was hmm. loosening them up all the time and wearing thinner socks to try to accommodate my feet. But that's when I discovered that I needed a size bigger shoe. And talk about buying particularly hiking shoes for peripheral oh, neuropathy. They sell hiking boots for peripheral neuropathy. However, you have to be careful when you buy them because the soles should really be knotty uh, like a regular hiking shoe with real good tread. But the ones I bought were smooth soled and would not work very well in this situation. And as you can see where my wife, Donna here, has her hiking stick there. And I do too. I did too, for that matter. Next slide. That's, that's uh, Yosemite River, I think, uh, in, just, in just Yosemite. Taking a break there. Just taking a break. Another example of the falls, the, the lower falls trail. That was the lower falls trails. The upper falls trails was <laughs> a lot steeper, but you can see it's rocky. And if you are having numbness or balance issues, I mean, it's really important, like you said, about the shoes and about having your trekking sticks um, along those trails. And, and let's say a, 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 you're probably going to be with a healthier member of the family we saw many people, in fact, one, one couple at the bottom of this trail, they said, can we go up as we are? They had no hiking shoes on. They had no water. They were not prepared in any way. And we advised them not to do the trail because they just didn't have on the right shoes or any equipment at all. What's interesting about the trails, I, I, when I researched the trip, I researched the trails and they will let you know which trails are easy, which are moderate, which are hard. Um, and it's a pretty good guide, but it's not always exact. Um, sometimes they'll say it's a moderate trail and it ends up being very easy. Sometimes they'll say it's a moderate trail and it ends up being very difficult. So it, it's a guide, but it's not, always, um, it's not always exactly as they portray it. A good example would be back in Acadia National Park. We, we oh, took our cool. bikes to go up there and do some bike riding. And we were told, and the, the, the write-up said this one trail is essentially level. Well, it was the opposite of level. It was all up and down for four miles up and down, very steep in places. So it was not level. Next slide, please. Okay. This was at the end of Yosemite. Uh, we took a drive to Monterey and did, did a hike um, along the coast. I don't know. If I, I have nothing to add other, other than the scenic view. It was like uh, by one of the more famous nationally known uh, golf, golf courses. courses. I want to call it Pebble Beach, but it could yes, be wrong. It okay. Uh, that was a beautiful, beautiful scenery. Okay. Next slide, Judd. Uh, our Utah hikes, we were in Bryce and uh, we, we did Capitol Reef, we right. did Escalante, what's the other one um, before Bryce? Um, basically started out in desert heat and made our way up to Park City in the snow, but uh, anything about walking in heat? Uh, no, I was good in these, in these parks. I don't remember anything, any concerns. Um, so I was good on these hikes. Mm -hmm. uh, next slide. Oops. No. That's <laughs> Tech issues. <clears throat> what I do remember, we got caught in a rainstorm and, you know, we had, we took preparations for that. So we all got our rain gear on. So you have to go prepared for almost anything any, any kind of weather to these national parks. And, and while we're switching slides, we'll add that you have to make a reservation about a year and a day in advance, no earlier than that. Well, that's just for like Was that Yellowstone? Yellowstone in the 70, okay. uh, if you're staying in the park. Right. It's, that's 
we can talk more about that, but yeah, that's important too, if you want to stay inside the park. Actually, Everything okay, Judd? Yep. Okay. Um, next slide. Next slide. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> Do you see Park City? No. No, no. no we're still seeing we're Bryce. Still see Bryce. Not moving forward. Donna, while we're waiting, I thought that was really informative when you told me that you it, you can either stay in the park or then you can obviously get a hotel motel outside the park or whatever. <coughs> Sorry. Right. Now we're back, uh, Judd, or we were. There we there go. We uh, very briefly, you said a year and a day. Is that across the national parks or just the busiest ones? Or It's bus Yosemite and Yellowstone are the two that we typically want to stay inside the bigger parks. Um, Grand Teton, Yosemite, not Grand Teton, I'm sorry, Sequoia National Park, Yosemite and Yellowstone had to be made a year and a day in advance if you wanted to stay in their lodges. <laughs> If you and want to stay outside the park, you know, you want to do it as early as possible because they're very popular. Why would you want to stay inside the park? What was the advantage versus something outside, which I know you'd have to drive in, but is there That's another the advantage, especially at Yellowstone. Yellowstone, when you stay outside the park, it's going to take you at least 45 minutes to an hour to get to the park. And then the park is huge. I see. And it'll take you maybe another hour to get to the point where you want to stop and, and see some of the different, you know, old faithful, wherever you're going in the park. Mm -hmm. So it's just distance and time. Um, when you stay in the park, you're still driving a lot in Yellowstone. Yosemite, the advantage of that, they have transportation. They mm -hmm. have shuttle buses. Right. Um, and you can, you know, if you're staying at the lodge in Yosemite, if you want to go to different uh, trailheads or different sites that you want to see, you can actually get a, a shuttle during the regular season. If you go there off season, not so much, but during the regular season, you can get these little shuttle buses that will drop you off at the trailhead. And then when you end your hike, wherever you end, you can pick up another one to take you back to the lodge. Okay. So that's the advantage of, of really staying in the park. Now Escalante that's showing and, and Bryce and, you know, uh, Capitol Reef, those parks, I don't know that they even have lodges inside the parks. So we just stayed in hotels on our way up um, okay. to these. And we drove to the different trailheads and to the visit. It's really important to go to the visitor centers too, before mm -hmm. you start doing yes. anything. They have lots of maps and information. And they can help you with hikes too. Yeah. Good. Okay, it looks like the slideshow is back. Okay, it's back yeah. on. Escalante was an interesting hike because it was sandy. Uh, Escalante? Yes. Yeah, but yeah, it was a very sandy uh, trail. Um, matter of fact, one of our you know, people that we were hiking with um, had a terrible time um, walking in it. And she, she really was, uh, her ankles and feet were mm -hmm. very sore. Right. Um, when we were done, it was a long hike. That was, yeah, it was, that a, was a good It was mile, about a six mile six, hike six one way yeah. to a nice, beautiful, tall waterfall. Yeah. And that was the whole point of the hike was to see this waterfall. But, and it was about a but six that mile hike. Tells you about the importance of fit of your shoes right. and, and the right kind of shoes. Right. Especially with PN. Uh, I had no particular issues this day, except, of course, it was it was on the warm and hot side. And that's why we're in shorts and, uh, but uh, it was, oh, I couldn't stand the cold water. I, I knew and I found out again that my, my, my feet burn in cold water. So I wasn't in for more than one second. I had to get out of the, of the waterfall water. Which was a shame because that was the whole reason we did, the, <laughs> did that long hike was to, you know, play in the water when we got there. But wow. Uh, next slide. That's up in Park City. Uh, that was after the um, Southern Parks, National Parks. We ended up in Park <laughs> City because our friends had a place up there. And we hiked many trails up there. And talk about height. What was the one? Well, it was around, we were, we were as high as 10,500 feet. This is around 9,500, between 95 and 10,000 right here. Wow. 
And this is in October of the year. We went to Utah between uh, October 1st to the 11th. Next slide. Next slide. This hike was the 10,000. This was up there. That was up there. That was pretty high. And another thing about trekking sticks, you're going to need them. And when you get your backpacks, if you have backpacks, you want to make sure you have backpacks that have a place for your hiking, your trekking sticks um, to, to stow them. Um, and had we known better, they sell, I don't know what they're called, grip-ons or something that you can put on your hiking boots that have metal um, spikes on them. Oh, that, yeah. That help you. Uh, I, yeah, ice, ice grippers. We didn't know that. We didn't know that. We just use our regular hiking boots, but I mean... This, this is, I dare I use the word, this is a very enchanting hike, as you can see with the winter, I call it the, in another slide, it might be called the winter wonderland. It really was a winter wonderland up there. Again, important to keep your feet warm. Keep, and I had to keep yeah. my feet warm again in this situation. Uh, next slide, Judd. Okay. Similar situation, wonderland, there it is. When, Utah winter wonderland. Uh, it really was a very beautiful, nice hike in the snow. Next slide. This is a more, more of a kind of a local for us. We lived in Cleveland, Ohio for uh, quite a number of years. And at the time, Cuyahoga Valley, the falls area was not a national park. It is now, but it's a nice park to hike and bike. It's pretty flat mm -hmm. and, um, you know, it is beautiful. It is Ohio, and people don't even think of Ohio being a somewhat pretty state, but it, this is a beautiful park. Biking was pretty easy yeah. there. Yeah, we did um, biking, too. It was flat, and the the trails were, were nicely kept, too. This is about 50 or 60, maybe 70 miles south of Cleveland, Ohio. Next slide, Judd. Oh, here we are. <laughs> we, just, we just ended up... Uh, uh, um, 11 day trip, 10 day trip down to the Everglades National Park, Biscayne National Park, and the Dry Tortugas National Park. And we took a seaplane to Dry Tortugas National Park. Mm -hmm. um, again, a lot of walking, a lot of hot. It was hot. It was hot. Hard walking on the uh, shell. I, I did, you know, by the way, when we were hiking, I don't know if we show a picture of it or not, but when we were hiking the fort area, it got very narrow and very close to the edges, which I had to be very careful yeah. of because of balance issues. Oops. We were up on the fort. Um, we were up on, on the top on of the, the fort. Top, and there was no safety there. It was just actually a yeah. little pathway. Uh, what I, I, I spent 40 years of safety and health and there's no fall protection on this fort. <laughs> Next slide. Next slide. Oh, there we go. Talking about the walking on shells. We're yeah, and I, I you know I discovered uh, on another island I cannot walk on these shells. Of course, there was a day when I could, but I'm I'm locked into place. I cannot walk on these shells, and of course I had on sneakers, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, proper foot protection that day. But you usually have to wear water shoes, and I or I wear water shoes, but I cannot wear I cannot go barefoot on them anymore. Next slide, Judd. That's it. Oh, that's it. That's wow. the uh, that's the book that I use a mm -hmm. lot of times to check on the different trails and the trailheads <clears throat> and where they are and how difficult they are. And I, I, I we don't usually choose easy trails. That's I I always want to have a challenge. So we usually choose the moderate trails and sometimes even a difficult trail. It depends on what what's at the end of the trail, right? What's going to be the prize that we get to see? What, right. what is the scene? What is, right. so we might, you know, chance a, uh, a, you know, a difficult trail just, just to get to where we want to go, but it's pretty good, but you're always in for a surprise. Sometimes uh, it's not exact. Even here in Pennsylvania, in central Pennsylvania, east of state college, we have a trail called the, uh, what Pennsylvania, the mid state mid trail, trail, and it goes right by a nice biking and hiking trail, goes across the trail and up the mountain. We discovered that there's a real rocky section of it that it was too far into the hike to turn around. I had to literally slide down these these rocks as I couldn't walk on them. I had to slide down on my butt all down these rocks. Yeah. Mm. 
just <laughs> because I couldn't I couldn't walk on them. But it we're too far into the hike to do anything about it. We had to keep going. As long as you have your trekking sticks, you have some, yeah. you know, something to hold on to. So thank you very much. And that's our oh, and next slide. Go okay, I'm sorry. Next slide. Oh, you want to show the? Uh, yeah. I guess we'll show them the supplements. Okay. I, I think people will slide. be interested. Oh, there we go. The one on the left is what saved my feet for the most part. Or it really it did. Uh, the mega benfotamine, the slip extension, as you can see. I started off at 250 a day for a week and then bumped it up to 500 a day. But that got rid of the pain of the burning. And I still take it at half the dose now. The lion's mane, I take and that helps my feet too. That settles them down. And also the alpha lipoic acid. Those three are my mainstays of supplements and I take no other, I take no prescription medication right now for PN. And I think that's the last slide. According to Wikipedia, benfotiamine is a synthetic form of thiamine, that is, vitamin B1. It was developed in Japan in the late 1950s in a desire to treat diabetic polyneuropathy. It has been shown to be more bioavailable than the form of B1 used to enrich foods such as white bread or white flour. There appear to be no serious side effects. B1 is normally found in whole grains and beans. A small 2001 study with 40 patients taking it over three weeks concluded only that more research is needed. A supplement was developed from the mushroom lion's mane. Some authors are big fans of mushrooms in general, including lion's mane. Okay. Oh, amazing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Amazing right. photos and uh, an amazing story as well. Uh, I there think were many, many more photos, but we'd be here until tomorrow. We probably took 3,000 <laughs> photos on all these trips. Yeah, we didn't show you <laughs> the, the really nice places that we got to during the hikes, but I thought it was important to show that Chuck was doing these hikes. So. Absolutely. It's so inspiring. As we said, just like Gregory's um, uh, journey this send off this morning just the preparation and the training that was involved but it sounds like you have been exercisers prior to PN you were already walkers bikers yoga enthusiasts or at whatever um, do you have any I'll start the question and answer period do you have any suggestions for those of us who are have not necessarily been preparing. People are telling us now to exercise, um, walking, whatever. Do you have any suggestions as to how a beginner could uh, start trying to be more active, especially knowing that they have PN? I tell you what, my wife was instrumental. Donna was instrumental in getting me started with yoga when I retired uh, or at least by 2017, I retired in late 2016. So I started doing yoga, but walking and bicycling are, bicycling are my mainstays. Walking doesn't take much prep. I mean, you just get a good pair of shoes. And, and I know some people are self-conscious about using trekking sticks on, you know, maybe sidewalks or we have, luckily we have a walking trail not too far from us, but I walk, I walk in the neighborhood. Um, I can't but, keep up with her. But he, Mm -hmm. trekking sticks i see trekking i see a lot of people using trekking sticks in city city kind even in the suburbs on on sidewalks and it is what it is you know if you have balance issues you don't want to be falling down on your walk and if if you're embarrassed about using the walking the trekking sticks then you're not going to exercise so you Absolutely. know you need you need to do it and i i you know that's the one thing get over your you know, inhibitions, in, yeah, inhibitions about <laughs> what people think. Okay. That, that's all. I see Joanne has her hand up, but I'd like Diva to answer perhaps, or I know we've had conversations about walking sticks and feeling somewhat intimidated or even embarrassed. Can you talk about your philosophy? Cause I thought it was really helpful. Oh, yeah. I mean, so I was very embarrassed about having the walking sticks at first and, um, basically was just like getting friends to come along with me so I wouldn't be like alone on the road and like getting looks from people 
Um, but then, you know, friends can't come to everything. Um, so I started going by myself. Um, at this point, I my walking speed has improved, so I walk too fast to even know if people are giving me weird looks. Um, there you go. Barring the sprained ankle from Monday. But um, yeah, so that, that's been like, I just kind of got to a point where I was like, I, I just I have to use these things and they are more of a help than anything else as judging from the fact that when I had both of them in one hand I immediately fell so there you go. Oh, you know. no. yeah so um, you know the the fact that they they are helping me and like I kind of like to think of it as you know if you're if you're given a prescription for glasses, no one's gonna tell you, okay, now you can see better. Stop wearing them. <laughs> well, open the gate um, about five minutes early so they can find their ride. Okay, five minutes. Okay. So, yeah, so that that's kind of how I see it as like you know the same as glasses. Like it's helping me do something that I can't do on my own, right. so like, I don't need to be embarrassed by it. Right. Good for you. Yeah. Good. Can Thank you address it's. Hi, it's Rebecca here. Can you address trekking sticks? What are you, what are we supposed to look for? What, um, well, in the height, I, I, a strap and a good handle grip up here. And a this good one grip. is telescoping, so it's short. You can make it as short as you need to stick on a backpack, or you can make it. You know, see, we can. Oh, I'm sorry. We can. We can. It telescoped in and out, and you can lock it. And you can make it, you can adjust it to the proper height. Okay. Now, telescoping um, hiking stick. And again, do you, the tip. Do, you, do you use one or do you, are you supposed to use two at a time? And what's the I, brand name of that? Okay, we use one. You've used two at times. I have used two on steep, on real steep stuff. My, my brother, who lives in Colorado, for our anniversary and retirement all in one, he got us each a pair of these Mountain Smith, and that's the brand name, Mountain Smith. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. Mountain Smith hiking stick. He got us a pair for real steep grades. So ideally, yes, you could and should use two hiking sticks for real steep grades. I honestly do not because they're not that long. But I, I see people all the time yeah. on flat. Yes. On flat trails with both their sticks. And if you need it for balance, that I think you need both. Um, yeah. Well, my husband and I like to travel a lot and we we go out and hump it. I mean, we we don't just, you know, sit on the bus. We go out and we look at the my husband's an historian, so I've seen every Roman ruin you can imagine. Um, but it's getting to the point where I'm I'm getting a little little unstable. And I feel like I need something. Mm -hmm. But if that closes down easily enough, I can put it, it in a... Okay. Yeah, it does. Yeah. And these are great from that standpoint. You want to... So your forearm is either level with the ground or slightly lower, but you don't want to have a stick that's going to cock your arm way up here. Okay, great. Thank you. Great help. Welcome. Joanne has been waiting patiently with her hand raised. So, okay. Joanne? Okay, well, actually, I have. I'll take... I'll take a little extra time because I have two questions or comments. I've been using hiking sticks for a long time and I usually just use one, but sometimes two. But I've also found that um, being a woman, it is really nice if I have things with pockets. And so oftentimes now with yoga pants or whatever, they don't put pockets in things. So now I've become very aware that it's much easier to get around if I have pockets and can stuff in my credit card and a little money and my keys and not have to carry a pocketbook and a hiking stick. My balance improves. So I would also advise people to, to, um, to look for things with pockets, maybe one of those travel vests with, with uh, places to stow things. But I had a question about biking. I bought a bike Mm, a couple of years ago, thinking that it would solve my issue. I was a step through, you know, that where you don't have to lift your legs so high. Right, right. And I thought I was really going to love it, but I'm very uh, <laughs> scared of it. I'm afraid of falling. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, have you experienced any um, problems with biking? Once you get on it, are you just ready to go? 
I am ready to go, Joanne. I really am. We just did a bike ride of six miles like two weeks ago just to get warmed up for the season. But no, biking, strangely enough, I have no issues at all with biking. And I'll tell you, Joanne, I have a step through. He does not. And we ha usually when we bike, we're biking about 20 miles. So we always carry a, a, a pack with us. He gets on his bike, swings his leg over and gets on. <laughs> I can't do that. <laughs> I have to lean forward, though, to do it. I can't do that. He scares me when he does it. I have to step through and then get started. So, and I don't have balance issues. So, I, you know, it's, that's, it's very, you know, that's very have helpful. You, have you tried an e-bike? No. Not yet, but I think I see it in my future someday, because, but not yet. Because we do like to bike a lot and the trails aren't always flat. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. You know. Well, um, I have two people with their hands raised, so we're going to move on. Uh, Rodney Smith, I think your hand is raised, but you need to unmute. <clears throat> Rodney is unique. He is volunteering as we speak to help kids and adults on the carousel at one of our local parks. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, go ahead, yeah, Rodney. I had a quick question on between rides. I got to start here pretty quick. Uh, you mentioned you're riding and you, you don't have any problem riding. And you said you've got balance issues. Right. My neurologist told me the only bike I ought to be riding is a stationary bike. So I was oh. just curious. Uh, on I, I honestly, you know, do not have any balance issues. On the bike. Even two weeks ago that I've noticed on the bike, I feel very comfortable. I'm not worried about anything. Uh, you know, I do get leg cramping from it later on in the day, but I deal with that. But that's the only issue I have. Hmm. Yeah. Does that answer your question, Rodney? Are you going to attempt a, a, a um, regular bike? Uh, or oh, are you I do when they told me that, I donated my bike. <laughs> oh. uh, so know, I don't strangely have enough. Listen, this is going to strike you all as strange and weird, and maybe I shouldn't do it. I played tennis last winter before Chris, around Christmas. I played tennis with Donna. Our grandkids were there, too, getting a tennis lesson from their aunt and uncle. But I played tennis almost like I was 25 years old. Now, I did notice some balance issues and concerns. I didn't lunge for the ball like I used to, but I played tennis. Excellent. And then I had to stop because of shoulder pain. That's another issue. <laughs> That's not we all have point. other issues. Rich Davis has been waiting patiently. Okay. Go ahead, Rich. Thank you. I'm, I'm reading now. Thank you, Rodney. Thank you for a very uh, exciting uh, presentation. My wife and I, we love to travel. And uh, sorry she wasn't here to see some of those pics. They're great. Um, so two quick questions. First... Uh, the walking stick. So I'm a tall guy. I'm about, uh, I, I like to tell people two meters, which is six foot seven. So I'm oh, wow. <laughs> so these walking sticks, do they come in various heights or are, they, are there any that might be adjustable? These are. These, these are adjustable, Rodney. Again, I'll let you be the judge. Oh, okay. Sorry. This 57 inches on the middle section and you know, and you can see there's this is pretty there's, darn there's long markings on it. Okay. So you can. So, and what, can, what brand was that one again? Uh, Mountain Smith. Let Mountain me Smith. Okay. Mountain Smith. Oh, here it is. Can everybody see that? OK. Yeah. Mountain Smith. OK. I think it's a high end, more it's of a not. high end stick. It's not. Oh, it's not. It's oh, okay. very inexpensive. Stick. Yeah, OK. Yeah. I like it. It's inexpensive and adjustable. Sounds good. Well, my yeah. brother got it, and he's not low end. <laughs> but anyway, it's a good stick. We like a mountain smith. I appreciate uh, that suggestion. And then second, uh, onto the biking. So my issue with peripheral neuropathy, it first started when I was in the car for extended periods, like maybe driving for several hours. Right. That's where it was that pressure. It's the pressure on the lower end, so to speak. And so I used to bike ride a lot and I gave it up about 20 years ago. I'm just wondering, um, cause it sounded like that, that those pressure points when you're riding a bike and I've heard some, some doctors say, you know, the bike seat, I mean, really, 
uh, I joke that what I really need is a tractor seat. Um, <laughs> any comments on that? Good point. Yeah, you want a seat that doesn't pressure you in the middle, a guy kind of thing, if you know what I mean. And I've been through, I've been through several seats to find the right one. Yes, yeah, so that's important to figure out. So you just <laughs> went to yeah. like I have a split seat. Yeah. Okay. Split seat. I'm familiar. I've seen those. Um, I do too. It's not just a guy thing. Um, <laughs> I tried the bigger seat, the tractor looking seat. Yeah, we had the tractor seats too. <laughs> I had a big seat. And I, I hated it. It was terrible. And you had it. I had one like too. It. So we went back to a regular a, size. A little bit smaller split seat. But it's a split seat and much more comfortable. I, have a I do have a stationary bike at home. And, and that one lends itself more to a, uh, like we're joking uh, affectionately about a tractor seat. But I just, you know, they're not that practical when you're, when you're out on the road. And my preference, particularly... This time of year, spring is my favorite time of year, yeah. is to right. be outdoors. Right. Rich, this is Judson. I have, a, Judson. I have a run with a tricycle, and it has a sling seat. It, you know, you just sit down on it like a chair, and then you ride it. It's got three wheels. It doesn't fall over when you get up, and it, you, can, you can put on some pretty good speed. Oh, okay. I, See, I'd advise I, taking a look at that. It's called a sling. Oh no, a, a recumbent tricycle. Recumbent oh. bike. And recumbent bikes are good too. You talk about, you know, you didn't want to do the, the regular uh, meat cleaver seat. <laughs> These are stationary you're talking though. No, no, yeah. I get out and ride on the parks. Oh, yeah. oh, recumbent outside, of course. No, no, yeah, I've seen them as well. But uh, yeah, I always thought of, you know, like, uh, when I first heard recumbent years ago, it was like yeah. the indoor. With yeah. Exercise. yeah, I've seen the outdoor yeah. as well. Yeah, no. and, and Rich, it's not just the seat. Do you have to? Get, I, I, we have padded pants. I mean, you get right. the padded bike pants that ah. help with the pressure points too. Uh, do they call those uh, Kardashian pants? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know, but it, it, it doesn't matter after thirty. Hey, three years ago, I don't care what it looks like. It feels good. <laughs> three years ago, we did a thirty-mile bike ride. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the state Pennsylvania. It's interesting. The the e-bike cyclist Greg that we keep talking about uh, mentioned to me today that one of his biggest issues in getting prepared was. Um, I think he called them saddle blisters, and uh, he has to be very wary because you can have infection set in. And he said he's going to be super careful on the on this thirty four hundred mile trip um, to make sure that he is uh, aware of that. And it reminded me of bed sores when the nurses had to turn you so that you you know didn't lie in the same position. I'm wondering now, we're about at our three o'clock mark and uh, uh, would like to ask if anyone else, I don't see any hands, but um, several people don't have their videos on. Is there anyone who would like to ask Chuck or Donna another question? <clears throat> um, and one thing I would say is the recording will be made available um, uh, Rich or whoever said about their, their wife seeing the pictures, um, Chuck and Donna have graciously agreed that we will be able to show that. So thank you. Phil Roach, you have a question, please. Uh, I, I do. Um, one, I am envious of your ability to hike. <laughs> it used to be one of my favorite activities. What kind of shoes are you wearing on a daily basis? I've had to, I've bought shoes. I have to, I went from a 12 narrow to a 13 double E, you know, uh, or triple E it's, you know, my feet are just flattened out. Right. Uh, uh -huh. crazy pressure points. So uh, I, I wear Merrell's seem to be okay, but I'm looking for recommendations on other types of shoes. Footwear. I think, well, for hiking, that's what I use are the Merrell. I'm not, I'm daily I, hiking oh, is Riga. not in my the, uh, world right now. <laughs> I have the, um, the sketcher, the green, Sketcher sports shoe that I love, olive green. I've had about 10 of them in the last many years. I buy one every couple of years or buy a pair. So the Sketcher nine wide, nine double wide. No, it's not nine four wide. Okay. Wow. <laughs> it's a nine double double wide, at least double wide, maybe two E wide, you know, double double wide. 
but they're the most comfortable shoe I've ever worn in my life. Okay. Skechers. Thank you. Skechers. This is something that comes up in every forum or group. What kind of shoes and what kind of socks right. work both for every day and also for more extensive work like you're doing? Chuck, go ahead. And I'm looking for socks, by the way, in case anyone has an idea. But I find socks are friction points, and that will irritate the heck out of my feet sometimes. The, the thicker, the better. <laughs> okay. Okay. And yeah, I, heard, I heard you saying you had to put thin socks on when you were getting blisters or whatever when your sh shoes were too uh, small. And my uh, physical therapist said always buy at least one size bigger. And I never knew that. So that's oh, by the way, yes. And that's, I, I've heard that. I went from an eight and a half normal width, regular width, D width to a nine wide if I could find it. I think I, I think these Merrells are 10 wide, by the way, mm -hmm. just for your information. And I had a friend who absolutely said you must buy Skechers. She hiked all over Europe with Skechers. And I was surprised because I thought that was more of a, you know, regular sneaker kind of thing, not certainly something that you would wear all over Europe. But this, this yeah. shoe I'm talking about, is only one of a couple of shoes that I found in their entire selection that's a double wide. Not many of them are double wides. I see. Yeah. Okay, Rebecca, you have a comment? Yeah. Um, I just saw a podiatrist a uh, couple of months ago. He fitted me for uh, uh, orthotics and everything. And he suggested Hoka, H O K A shoes, Hoka okay. Bondies. And they are all, they also, I have a wide foot also, but I could actually wear their regular size width because they've got a very wide toe box. Okay. And they're very comfortable. They're very supportive. So that's H O K A, Rebecca? H O K A. Right, and, got and, it. Um, Thank and, you. And uh, that's the brand and the style I got was called Bondi. Okay. Well, it's, Bondi. Inter it's interesting because they, We've had other um, shoe presentations, and one person said that the Hoka's are very expensive. So you, I don't know what that means. I didn't look them up, um, but they said that they were well worth it. And then another person got on and said they didn't help me at all. I hated them. So I really think Judd is right. Get him professionally fitted. Don't just buy something you know off the rack on somebody's recommendation. Diva, you have your hand up. Um. I realized very recently that professional shoe fittings are often free, which I really didn't think they would be. So I went to Potomac River Running, which they have a bunch of branches like all around this area. And they had like a whole like 3D like treadmill gate scanner and like um, like a bunch of things. They made like a model of my foot and everything. So like um, and they were the ones who also told me to get something that was like a size bigger and it has really helped. And what brand is, did you end up with? I ended up with Hoka. Okay. Yeah, oh, the okay. Body, just like Rebecca said. All yeah. right. Good. All right. If I have no other hands, uh, did I miss anybody in the chat? Well, I, I had a question about one of the supplements that said real mushrooms. Yes. Or, uh, what does that mean exactly? Well, real mushrooms is a is a is a manufacturer, Judd. Uh huh. That's the manufacturer. My daughter, who's a, into herbal science, suggested I try it, and it did work for a while to take much, if not all, the uh, pain and discomfort away. I got away from it in favor of the of the benfotamine. Now I'm back on a dose of a, a capsule a day of the uh, real mushroom, but it's. It's real mushroom is a manufacturer. But it is. A I assume it has mushrooms. Science Maine is, 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 a, is the mushroom. Yeah. Okay. And it does wonders for my feet. Uh -huh. And you're also still taking the alpha lipoic acid? Yes, I'm taking, you know, a lot of that per day. Uh, as a matter of fact, a, a, an arthritis doctor I'm seeing, it's a long story, but it's not really arthritis, but. She said I could take a lot more than 1,200 a day on uh, Lipoic. I don't know how much she said, but it's more than 1,200. But anyway, I take 1,200 milligram per day. And we talked basically, someone said that if you're doing alpha-lipoic, you should do the R 
alpha lopaic, but I understand it's more expensive. It's more expensive. I used to do that, but it's way more expensive. And I cut back to the regular. My understanding is there's still a little bit of R alpha lipoic in the regular, but it's, it's not 100%. I see. Okay. All right. If there are no other questions, I'd like to uh, say thank you and a, a round of applause for a wonderful presentation. We appreciate it. Thank uh, you. Very, very much. And we're going to then move on. You are welcome, obviously, Donna and Chuck, to stay for our open discussion. Sure. But Judd is going to give us a very quick review of donations. We need donors to uh, step up to keep up the website and other expenses we have. So if you want to spend uh, five minutes there, Judd, if you're ready. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just going to bring up um, this. Uh, <clears throat> we'll, we'll get to that later, but right. pnsnnetwork.org is our new um, way of getting to the website uh, and uh, not to put too much emphasis on it because we are doing okay on fundraising, but we always like to, uh, we use the NPR model. If you, you know, you can listen to the radio for free, but if you want to contribute, it's there for you. You can use the website, our Facebook page, come to the meetings and so forth with no charge. But if you want to get a little more invested in it, you certainly are welcome to, and let me show you how to do that. Um, we have um, a, um, uh, well, let's see, where, where am I? No, just go on down the page to the yeah, there we go. Uh, we have a, under members, it says donations, just go to that. And that's the donations page. It tells you why you might want to give. And then uh, it says, make a donation. Uh, and by the way, while I'm here, uh, that we are a tax exempt group. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. And so your, your contributions are tax deductible. Uh, if you want to make a donation, first of all, you can send a check to Rebecca. That's her address right there. It's on the website and we can put it in the uh, chat if we, if we need to. Uh, but you can also contribute um, electronically. And so that would be the way we might do that is to, I see that link is broken. Um, we, you can go right here. The, our little device that we use for collection is, is called Cheddar Up. And right now it looks like we have $1,200 in there. That's actually wrong. Those, that's the people that have contributed through electronic. If you wrote a check, I think our total funds are somewhere around uh, 1900 uh, Rebecca can, can um, hi, it's Rebecca total funds. Now I, I received a check last month. I think there were about total funds are about 2,400 now. Great. Excellent. Okay. Yeah. And, okay. and so anyway, you can, but Judd keeps telling me he's going to send me a bill. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know uh, Rebecca's going to cut me off real soon. If I don't, it, it, if it's, I don't uh, 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 straighten down. It, okay. It's it's uh, it, it it's time to renew our our website. So it's uh, we're gonna we're gonna put a big hurt in that uh, total real quick. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the problem. Is we gather a bunch of money and then uh, Rebecca's right. I have about a thousand dollars in expenses, or I don't know whatever I told you last time. And I'm I do I'm getting those together. It's I'm not there yet, but Rebecca, please have faith in me. And, uh, well, uh, I just want to save our volunteers pony up the money in, a, in advance because the bill comes due and they just pay it out of their own pocket. And then they don't ask for reimbursement from uh, Rebecca. So it looks like we're flush, but we really aren't. So if you are enjoying these presentations or the support you receive from um, coming to these meetings and hearing the 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 speakers, et cetera, we would appreciate your making a tax deductible uh, donation. Yes, we're definitely. To, we're going to go ahead now and welcome uh, any new member or participant today. If you uh, would like to raise your hand, if you're new or if you would like to introduce yourself, no 
um, requirement, just the opportunity if you'd like to say hello to the group and maybe uh, a brief comment about your PN journey. Is there anyone who would uh, like to introduce themselves? Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yes, we can. We only see your telephone number, so if you would please tell us your name, that would be helpful. Absolutely. Uh, my name is John Deal. I'm a new member. Yeah. I really enjoyed uh, this program, and uh, as we all can certainly appreciate, uh, uh, we all have a, a ongoing battle with uh, with PN, and uh, it's helpful to hear ev everybody else's uh, take on it and and observations. Uh, uh, you can't do without our, our good doctor friends, but uh, there's a lot of information that uh, hasn't uh, been discovered yet. So we're, we're all waiting for uh, to find that, uh, that uh, cause and effect uh, of our neuropathy. But it, it's really uh, uh, heartening for me to, to, uh, to hear everybody else uh, give their opinions and, and whatnot. And uh, I really enjoy this. It's, uh, and I want to thank everybody for it. Welcome, John. Where are you uh, located? I'm in Ruston, Virginia. Okay, in Ruston. Well, we're happy to have you, and uh, please join us every month. If you join, and that's really important to know, uh, Judge just showed you and uh, mentioned the website change in name. You can still get to it from dcpnsupport.org. Uh, we've just updated it to PNSN to represent the network effort. Uh, but either of those will um, work. And if you click on, the, there's a spot on the homepage, a button on the homepage where you can click on join. That will, yes. then you will be sure to get the invitations. There you go. And I also beside it, the donate and volunteer, always, always interested in volunteers or tech help. So those are important things at the top of the page that you uh, might want to know about. So join will guarantee that you get invitations to future um, events and uh, speakers. So welcome, John. That's terrific. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Is there anyone else who would like to introduce themselves? Okay, then we have uh, a bit of time now for open discussion beyond just talking about hiking and trails. Uh, you can still ask John, Chuck and Donna who have kindly stayed if you didn't get your question asked or you thought of something um, uh, as we talked, or if there's anything else you'd like to know about the e-bike event or anything related to peripheral neuropathy, this is the time to, to share and to learn and uh, even do a little bit of socializing. So anyone have a question? I will I ask a question, but I have a comment, Pat. Please, Chuck. <clears throat> Why, um, what got me started in taking the, the supplements, uh, the benfotamine last year, somebody I met in CJ's group has a theory and he claims it's working for him is a reduced sugar diet mm. to help I, my understanding now from Dr. Hoke is that it may only help with the sheathing, with the sheathing and help eliminate or reduce the deterioration or even reverse it of the elimination of the myelin sheath around the nerve. <clears throat> I happen to have the other one, which is axonal deterioration. <clears throat> I just want everybody to know sugar may be an important part, uh, important thing to reduce as much as possible. Oh, yeah. I think, oh, yeah, and, and I think that's true. People say automatically, well, diabetic neuropathy. Uh, it seems that from what I've read in the forums and, and uh, uh, studies, et cetera, uh, I don't want to say it quite like sugar is poison um, or sugar is evil. It but is. <laughs> it's almost funny or sad, Lou Masway, that we ended up serving donuts this morning. Maybe we should have been more cautious about what we were <laughs> providing the public, um, feeding their, uh, but the thing that I laugh about is that I, when I retired, I had, I'm a baker and I love to bake. And I thought, oh, I'm going to take fr French patisserie classes and I'm going to learn macarons. And then I decided that uh, the pain and burning wasn't worth it. So I really have tried to cut back. 
Um, now, in, in my own case, it seemed not to bother me that I eat sugar so much. I eat more than I should. Mm -hmm. I have reduced it, but I've also not cut back in other areas. Uh, but I have a cousin who has peripheral neuropathy in her forearms and hands. She is on a keto diet to at least slow it down, slow down the progression. She hasn't noticed an elimination of it, but she's hoping to slow it down. How long has she been doing it? A year, a couple of years. And it still hasn't really... You no, know, it hasn't reversed it, but it, she's hoping for it to slow down. I see. She, Phil, do you have a comment? Uh, yeah, I was... Um, uh, to, to follow up on the sugar stuff, um, uh, a nurse friend of mine has suggested that I uh, maybe experiment... I have a really bad sweet tooth. Experiment with types of sugar. And mm -hmm. I found that, that, that chocolate, milk chocolate, is extremely toxic. Very, very... It contributes greatly mm -hmm. to my the aggravation of my uh, PN uh, symptoms. Um, so, uh, but dark chocolate, not so much. That was an interesting discovery. You know, the, yeah. the, 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 the purer, the the higher the cacao content, the it, it doesn't doesn't seem to aggravate my neuropathy as much. It's cheap cheap milk chocolate. <laughs> cheap milk chocolate. Uh, yeah. I you know. I, eat, I I eat the seventy two percent Ghirardelli dark chocolate. I have dark chocolate every day. If I have to. I do, too. <laughs> yeah, I do, too. Antioxidant value, too, in dark chocolate, from that's what I've okay. read. But, Lou, we could be eating blueberries for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I, like eat those I eat blueberries, too. I eat those too, Pat. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Joanne, you have your hand raised. Oh, okay, I, I have another question about the cold feet. I mean, I think I've had cold feet my entire life, and but uh, the problems that you were talking about with cold feet, I've, I've not heard other people bring that up. And I'm just kind of curious about it. Oh, they burn, Joanne. They will burn. And in, in in, when I have to go out and plow snow in the wintertime, I have to put foot pads or toe pads on top and, and, and foot sole pads in the bottom of my winter boots. But wow. I'm ex extremely susceptible to cold. In fact, like I said, in that waterfall lake, what that was ice cold, it burned my feet. It was probably 55 degrees. I, mean, that's, I think, huh. Joanne, I think it's very typical for folks with neuropathy. To, I mean, my feet are always cold. It's the circulation is, right. is poor. And so that's why my feet are always cold too. My hands are really warm, but mm -hmm. not yeah. the other end, not so much. Well, I have, I have cold feet, but I, Actually, sometimes like when, when we're at a cold lake or something, sticking my feet in, it feels wonderful. So yeah. I'm, you know. I'm, That's good to rub the feet. That's good to By massage the same your own feet, especially if you're sitting, you know, massage. It doesn't, it's helpful, I think. Yeah. Well, when Some the people physical... are bothered by hot water. Hmm. So it's when, just yeah. the opposite. Okay, right. we have two people. Um, Helene, with your hand up, please. Yeah, I was just going to comment on two things. My podiatrist tells me every time that I have the coldest feet he's ever seen or felt in his yeah. life. Ooh. And they're purple and gray and all kinds of good colors. And uh, there seems to be nothing we can do about it except double up on socks. But right. yeah, but it does feel like it's burning when it gets cold, which right. is very bizarre. Did um, you the other thing is I have really severe pain and I, I, I'm on a lot of medications that seem to help. But is anybody who's been in foot pain been able to, I, luckily I hiked when I was younger. I did the national parks when I was younger, but I'm so jealous looking at those pictures. And I can't even walk through the grocery store now. So I'm wondering if anybody has found a solution for those of us who still have foot and leg pain to get out and hike, I don't know. I'm asking. Try the benfotamine. The, uh, yeah, try the benfotamine. Benfotamine. I'm not, I'm not kidding. When I, that's my claim to fame. If I have one, helping this other gentleman, helping me to discover that okay. is not my claim of better health, better PN health. All right, I will. I don't know of any limitations on it. I don't know of any interactions. I, I'm on blood thinner, and then it's not affected my blood thinner. 
Okay. I'm I'll not kidding. Try it. try it. I try a 250 milligram. I mean, I can't, I shouldn't tell you this. <laughs> I use benfotamine and okay. so at 250 a day. That's correct. Remember, we, we always start this meeting, and I didn't actually say it, that we are not doctors, we are not right. diagnosing, and we are not recommending. Right. We are sharing information and experiences that you can research, talk to your own doctors about. Um, I know we're going to have, in a minute, we're going to have a talk, a brief overview of the May 7th meeting, which is going to be a panel, a panel on cannabis use. And again, uh, it will be with the um, disclaimer that we are not suggesting, recommending. We are saying, however, that you should be talking to your doctors about what you're taking in case there are interactions. Phil. Right. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to, uh, when uh, uh, particularly bad pain at night, um, I I've used for relief. Um, I'm, I'm not taking any opioids anymore. I I I've, after eight years of opioid use, I'm... I'm not on that stuff anymore. Uh, of course, I <laughs> have substituted medical cannabis for that, but that's okay. Uh, it's a personal choice. Uh, I just got tired of every time you walk into a doctor's office, they're, they're, you know, I got tired of being accused of shopping for drugs. You know, so okay. just don't, I don't want your drugs. I just want you to you know look at this and make sure everything's fine. Right. Um, anyway, uh, Roman chamomile oil. It's just a topical oil. Uh, it's a, an essential oil. You, you can apply it on your feet. Uh, it's, it's organic, it's <laughs> non-toxic, it's over-the-counter, it's not expensive, and it, it, does, it, do, it does provide uh, a, a lot of relief in a very short period, and then you know, that, that kind of tapers out, but it's usually enough to allow me to, to drop off to some semblance of sleep. Um, so okay. it, Roman chamomile. Chamomile. Okay. Would you, Phil, would you please check the chat? Judd put down um, a phonetic spelling of it, but would you make sure okay, that sure. it's it's correct? Because people will want to uh, perhaps uh, check it out. Um, I know that Consumer Lab, we've talked about in the past of spending money as a group um, to get a subscription because they will, they do... Um, analyses and uh, Consumer Report, which is different from Consumer's Lab, um, has just recently published uh, information on um, different brands. And they were one of the issues, of course, was that you don't always know what's in the, uh, whether there are fillers, what, who has manufactured them, um, right. whether sure. what, what's in there is actually what they say is in there. That's why if people have experienced, like they say, a name brand that they have had experience with, I find that helpful rather than just going out on the internet and looking up Deuterra. Roman chamomile. So. Deuterra. Right, let me put that in the chat. Yes, if you the would brand, put that. The brand name is Deuterra. Excellent. And hey, um, yes, uh, uh, Rodney. I, yeah, you said maybe a short uh, tour of the carousel here. I'm going right. off duty. So. Okay. Very, this will be a quick little break for us. <laughs> okay. So Rodney, anyway. you, Rodney always dresses up at Santa Claus during the winter. But. <laughs> so, but anyway, it's a fairly it's a unique carousel. It's, I guess it's about four or five years old now. But all the animals, I got, had the opportunity to talk to the designer when she came by to see it. She said all the animals are native to uh, Virginia. So, for oh. example, for a long time, you can see we got seahorses and, of course, eagles and frogs. and But this bird here, for a long time, I was thinking that was an ostrich. But it's not really. It's a blue heron. So, oh, yeah. See the feet there? Web yeah. feet. Thank How cool. And of course, they got the, got the wolf and the, the white-tailed deer and the turtles and everything like that. So, and it uh, it's open. Well, it's opened up. This weekend through uh, the end of, uh, of May, and then it'll be open every day during the week. And they have a, in addition to it, there's a nice uh, playground and a spray park. So if any of you are in the area and have grandkids or anybody else wants to come, it's a good place to come. And the carousel costs money to go ride, but the spray park is free and the rest of the stuff is free. And remind us you're at Akatink? No, this is at Lee District Park. Oh, Lee District. Sorry. Lee District oh, yeah. Park. And it's on uh, 
just off the Telegraph Road at Rose Hill Drive. Well, so. thank you for making kids happy, and we're so happy to be able to be out again in the past, hopefully, the pandemic and in the warmth of the spring sunshine. Thank you, Rodney. Appreciate that. God bless. I'll continue to listen. Uh, thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, everybody, it's Rebecca here. I, I need to sign off for now, so I'll see you next time. Okay, okay thank, thank you, you Rebecca, and enjoy bye -bye. your rest of your Colorado trip. Okay, bye-bye. Really bye -bye. We're bye -bye. jealous. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If there is there one other quick question to Chuck and Donna, if they're still available, um, you mentioned toe warmer or foot warmers. Do you right. use hand warmers? No hand warmers. I do. I use a mechan. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, something my daughter-in-law got me for Christmas a couple of years ago. It's a hand warmer. It's an elect electric hand warmer. You turn it on and off. I put it in my pocket, get it out to warm up my hands, but it's nothing then then is different from past winters. I see. Okay. I just have it and I use it. But my, my hands are okay right now. My mother had Renard syndrome and also peripheral neuropathy. So it, she had a terrible time with her hands. And I was thankfully mine haven't started a little tiny bit at the fingertips. And uh, I'm hoping to avoid that. But I will tell you, Pat and others. I, I have a difficult time handwriting. Mm. I have a difficult, that's why I asked Dr. Hope for a Parkinson's test. And he did, he did a test with both my arms and hands. And in about five minutes, he says, you don't have it, not, at least not yet. And he's satisfied, professionally, he's satisfied. But I'm concerned about it for the long run. I see. I practically have to draw my signature. Hmm. So it's just a personal thing right now with me. But this is a recent change? It, for the last eight years since I got it, and I've noticed it coming on slowly. I remember at my old job, I would, I would dread signing a report because I'd actually have to try to have neat handwriting. Oh, wow. <laughs> I did it, but I didn't like it. I see. Hmm. Okay. And Diva, I have one quick question, if you don't mind answering um, <laughs> It, you talked about people um, chastising you or whatever word you might say when you tried to, to use to uh, join a line. Was it at Disney? And and people it was Six Flags, yeah. yeah. Six Flags. And can you tell us because I think people are conscious of uh, they're looking for disability. Um, agencies that will help them plan trips, knowing that they have these disabilities. But your experience was, um, again, a, like your like your sticks, they can be humiliating. So can you talk a little bit about that or perceive? Yeah, so, um, so basically, like the process at Six Flags involves a doctor's note. So I'm, I'm good with walking, but I can't stand for long periods of time. And those lines are mainly just standing and often at like weird angles because they go uphill and downhill and all of that. Um, so first of all, Six Flags as a whole isn't super accessible because like you get um, like the wheelchair entrance is like through the back. So there's kind of like a bunch of roadblocks where like the back path is too narrow so you like come face to face with people exiting the ride um and then like you know it's a big like kind of squeezing path and all of that but like i did get my doctor's note and i got the wheelchair and i got the pass to like you know get in from the back of the rides but people i guess are just super frustrated from waiting in those long lines all day and they were just angry so um, people were kind of like actively like getting mad at me and um, like, you know, even like kids were just like, she can walk. I saw her. She just walked. And with kids, I kind of tried to be like, you know, you don't need to like be like you can walk and still need a wheelchair um, because, you know, that kind of came from ignorance. And with like but with the adults, like there was like just so much anger in people um because you know hot day they've been waiting in lines um so basically like um some of the like my my younger cousins who i was with were like try to look sicker 
you know, try to cough a little. That doesn't really, like, mean anything. That doesn't really do anything. And that seems kind of pointless. So um, I, I just, like, it was a good day in that, like, I got to spend time at Six Flags. But overall, it was just, like, a very, like, an experience where I was kind of constantly on edge and um, where I was just waiting for the next person to yell at me, basically. Um, because at every like back entrance that we went through, I was getting yelled at and I didn't want to like be sitting in the wheelchair all day. Like I wanted to kind of get my blood flowing and get moving a little bit, but I was afraid that any anytime I stood up um, and like started walking on my own, that made people angrier because they were like, oh, she can walk. So that's something where like, you know, I've been working on like writing about it and I'm going to write something about that experience um, after I write something about this experience. Um, <laughs> I'm going to write about just like how like people kind of view it as like if you can walk then you don't need a wheelchair or if you can walk like people don't necessarily even realize that walking and standing use different like muscles and like you know um like affect you differently so it's possible to like i can now walk um you know like i can walk for like two hours straight and be fine um but when i went to a museum and stood for that amount of time it was like all the stabbing and like hurting and all of that so it's like a really like a big difference for me and standing hasn't gotten any easier even the walking has so um yeah so that's that's been a big one for me but i wanted i do want to write about it and like um there are a lot of people i know on like social media and everything who are trying to kind of spread awareness of like walking like the ability to walk and the ability to stand is not the same as like how much is it going to hurt you over long periods of time so um yeah that's something i've been like reading about especially with like these content creators and bloggers and stuff. So a lot of people are kind of working on spreading awareness of that. Thank you. For, I, I, Thank think, you. I think that I wanted to say that because we sort of um, are faced with an invisible illness and people don't perceive and it's even difficult. Um, Diva's going to talk at, at the very end about her uh, personal story on the uh, foundation's uh, webinar roundtable, sorry. And one of the questions that was asked is how do you explain to people what PN is when they can't see any obvious disability or, or problem? So that was one concern. But before we get to that point, we Mike, you have a comment about supplements and Chuck had an answer. So could you talk a little bit about that? It was in the chat, if Mike is here. Maybe, Maybe not. He's muted. So, oh, sorry. Serious. Yeah, yeah, I. Uh, it, as I say, it it, it doesn't. It, we just don't have the research being done on supplements. The economic situation is such that there's not a lot of. No company is going to spend a ton of money researching a, a chemical that they cannot. Um, the, 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 where they can't. Uh, get a patent on it and and so no one's willing to pay for the research the research that has been done such as an alpha lipoic acid was done by the government uh, because it was being prescribed fairly widely and they pulled out some money and, and did some research but but in general like for instance the the, the supplement that chuck responded uh, was described uh, which i can't pronounce um it you know is anybody is any company willing to pay for that research? Probably not. And so we're in a situation where we're really dependent on the government to step up and, and take a look at it. And it's especially, it's especially nasty because people who do do research, generally speaking, are only going to do research on, on diabetic neuropathy, which is the most common one. And what we've been finding out over and over again is that there's an awful lot of forms of peripheral neuropathy that don't apparently be related to diabetes. So we, we got a double problem there. 
Yeah. Like I said, the absence of evidence doesn't prove the absence of effect. It could, there, it could very well be an effect, but, but, but going from that to make a recommendation that somebody else take it, that's, you know, we don't know. Was there something about your body that makes this so effective? Or is it a placebo effect? Or is it just varies all over the place? You know, we're really in a situation where it would, off, it would help an awful lot if the government was in a position to do more research. Chuck, do you have a response? Well, right. And I agree with Mike for the most part. But I honestly have proven to myself ALA works for me. The benfotamine works for me. And uh, the mushroom, the lion's mane mushroom works. Um, by the way, lion's mane is a Chinese remedy going back thousands of years. Mm. And there's no medical proof per se. There's no Western medical proof on any of them mm -hmm. that I'm aware of. Um, so, but, but, but I know that ALA works for me because I would lay awake at night and I'd have these weird feelings in my feet. I get up and take an extra dose of ALA and then I would feel better in a few minutes and go to sleep. The, 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 and it the did it on more than one occasion. I, I, I don't know whether you want me. I, I talk too much. I, um, <laughs> uh, here, here's the problem with pain. Pain is something that's mediated by our brain. Right. And, and we, we know an awful lot now that we didn't know 20 years ago about the way in which the brain takes sensations and turns them into alarm, mm -hmm. which, which is basically telling us to do something about right. whatever's going on in our body. Right. And we're sitting there helpless. Mm -hmm. We don't know what to do. Right. You've right. done some things that very well may have explicitly done something to change the sensations that are coming from your body into your brain. But uh, someone else might say, well, no, what you've done is you, your, your, your body, your, your brain said, do something, and you right. did something, right. and you feel a little better. Right. You feel better. Your brain is handling those sensations differently. What is, the re what is really going on? Right. We, we simply, at this point, don't really know. Yeah, I, I but I'm sure I'm, one of the things I think that the, the themes that I'm doing is – when you have pain, you've got to do something about it. You must, because otherwise you can't continue with your life. Right. And so you have lived a magnificent experience, and you've done it. You've aided your ability to get to that point in your life by actively working to deal with this pain. That was job one. That, that is what we have to do. we got to get on with our life. Whether that proves that that medicine is, well, it doesn't. It, we, we just don't have the research at, at our disposal yet. Yeah. I'm you know, curious. By the way, on a different subject, excuse me, Pat. Go ahead. Does any, do, do you all have a clear understanding of, I mean, I, I do since I have a balance issue. I learned from the foundation what causes the balance issue. Your nerves, certain nerves aren't communicating with the brain. And there's lack of communication between your feet and your brain. That's why we have a balance issue. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but basically that's what's going on. Sure. Essentially correct, yes. <clears throat> My physical what, what? therapist has said over and over again that we need to retrain my brain to say, and he makes me do seemingly impossible tasks where you just, you know, if you close your eyes, it's proprioceptors, and you, you are like, where am I in space? Right. And that's part of the issue. And uh, Mike used to say to me, um, PN won't kill you, but the fall may. Right. And so we're all very conscious of that. But how do we retrain that brain? And that's what I'm working on. Rich, you have a question, please. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, for Chuck, um, just in general, PN manifests itself in two basic ways, just to be very simple. Um, pain and numbness. I'm fortunate my symptoms are more on the numbness side, not the pain side. Mm -hmm. um, the products, the, the supplements, and I'm, I'm all in, I'm interested, I'm curious. Do you find that they help um, mitigate 
your, is it the numbness part or the pain symptoms? Which, which, of, which type of symptom does it mitigate? It mitigates the burning pain. Okay. Not the, the numbness is there probably forever. That's the, I'm the, for that the burning cure. pain is what has been helped. Okay. Yeah. I'm not there yet, but who knows, you know, the way this, you know, there's so many variants of this insidious disease and um, who, who knows I'm, I'm at my fourth or fifth year, roughly. Um, I don't know what turn it'll take, but it's nice to know what's out there. So thanks. Yeah. I'm not kidding. When I say the benfotamine last summer, turned me around, turned my feet around. And so, you got that recommendation from another um, member of another, another group? member of CJ's group. Uh-huh. And In fact, you, he formed his own group. He doesn't do it anymore, but he formed his own group. There was four of us there. And, you know, uh, I see him once in a while in these other Zoom meetings, but there was four of us that were interested in the concept of sugar being such a big part of causing PN. Okay. But it turns out a certain forms of PN and not all forms of PN. Okay. Helene, you need to unmute. Is there somewhere in the chat the spelling of the benfotamine? I'll spell it right now. Okay. It's, it's at the, yeah, I'll spell it out. Yes, it will be at the end of the uh, recording, but. Uh, just for convenience, if you will put it in the chat, that would help. And also the brand name, if there, if that's important, because yes, I know yeah. nothing about uh, the, the name of it even. Life extension, okay. Okay, that's right. I remember now. And while he's typing that, go ahead, Diva, please. So for the whole balance thing, what I was told by my neurologist, um, not Dr. Hope, but also at Hopkins, is that... Um, with the signals not coming to my brain from my feet, um, that's where the um, the hiking poles, in, like one in both hand for me is what helps because it helps the signals kind of come through, like diminish from my feet, um, but also come through from my hands because the hiking poles do kind of tell my hands where I'm at with respect to the ground. Mm -hmm. So that has been really helpful and I can give no other testimony than when I had both of them in one hand instead of one in each, I straight up fell. That's right. And the other thing that you commented on in the chat was the fact that you look young and healthy, which complicates your situation. And I would like to give testimony to Diva because she has reminded us that this is not just an older person's disease. And she has introduced us to a couple of her friends who are younger as well. And uh, it raised my awareness for sure, um, even in terms of our pictures that we are using on the website to not suggest that this is just part of aging or it's an elderly disease. So go ahead, Diva, with your comment about looking healthy. Oh, yeah, like, um, something that I've found is that just because I'm, you know, like, I'm in my 20s, and I'm kind of expected to behave like someone else in their 20s, um, and I look healthy, people don't really expect there to be anything wrong with me. Um, and when they kind of see, like, see that there is, they might sometimes think I'm faking, which is what happened at Six Flags, like faking to get out of lines and everything or they might just like some people kind of have like interpreted it as something for attention because it just doesn't compute in people's heads that like there's nothing visibly wrong with me and I'm young and you know and and I have this so it doesn't really like make sense in people's heads so they can sometimes react badly because of it um but yeah, that's so that's something that I've kind of noticed. But of course, in like this community and like in my friends, like it hasn't mattered. And um, just kind of going back to like what Pat was uh, was saying um, is that I've kind of developed a bunch of like fun analogies that I use for my friends and coworkers and everything. Um, and it's like, like the hand numbness is like if I was wearing latex gloves and trying to touch my fingers together, and it's like there's something in the way. So this is for my small fiber. 
um, and it feels like there's something in the way. That's how I feel when there's no gloves on my hand, that like just that outer layer of the skin that's numb, it just feels like there's something in the way. Also, like I'm wearing leggings, like I feel like I'm wearing leggings even when I'm not, just like there's a layer that I can't feel. So because numbness makes people kind of think paralysis or like just having no feeling whatsoever, but but it's it's not that it's like I have diminished feeling and people can't often perceive that. So that's where I've kind of like tried to come up with these analogies for um, for all of that. And like for the pains, it's like when you get static shock, except it kind of instead of it coming from outside in, it goes from inside out. Good observations. Je uh, Diva was just a member of the uh, Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy's Roundtable. They had uh, mm -hmm. uh, several people invited to uh, explore their personal PN journey, um, answering questions, et cetera. And that will be, um, that link is going to be posted in the past webinars. It was just held on March 31st. It's not up yet, but this is where you will find it. You also find the recordings of others like um, Navigating Neuropathy with Nutrition, which might in interest those who are questioning the whole sugar thing. They've just had vetting sources of medical and scientific information. I missed that one and I'm definitely going to uh, go back and listen to it. So please look through their past webinars uh, by going to FPN. Dot org. You don't even have to remember Foundation for Peripheral Neuropathy. Thank you. And now we're going to move to um, Rich Davis, who's going to tell us briefly about what we're hoping to accomplish on uh, our May 7th meeting. Uh, go ahead, Rich. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Pat. So uh, five weeks. We get an extra week uh, in between meetings here now. Um, in five weeks, we're going to have a, a medical cannabis panel. And this got prompted, I think, in prior meetings. We heard a lot of interest on this topic. Um, and I think there's a lot of experience among our members, uh, various experiences. So what, uh, what we're trying to do is uh, we're in the process of lining up four to five people to speak for five, 10 minutes, you know, whatever they're comfortable with. Um, each on their on their personal cannabis experience. Glad to see uh, Phil uh, with us uh, and appreciate Phil that you volunteered. Um, I volunteered to serve as the as the panel moderator. So uh, my job is to try and keep the discussion uh, on track and on time. Um, We've been getting comments from some others. It's, it's interesting. I think a lot of folks have a lot to add on this topic. And, um, uh, you know, we're all looking for, you know, whatever, whatever the silver bullet might be, or not necessarily a silver bullet, but just something that might help, you know, relieve some of the symptoms. Um, we've had other members who unfortunately would not be able to attend. They'll be um, one of them I know. Okay. Your way, and um, so so Pat uh, is getting those comments, and she'll be sharing some of those. But as as Pat did mention, and I'm glad you did, Pat. I've been making some notes because you'd asked me to come, you know, just to give a, a brief update that that the purpose of this, like all of the meetings, and I think by now we should all understand that we're here to to share our personal experiences about uh, what treatments or prescriptions or whatever are working or not working uh, for us, but that um, we're not, we're not going to be promoting or endorsing um, any particular treatment or prescription or anything like that. I mean, no matter what you try in every case, I think everyone realizes that you need to, to consult your doctor. Okay, Saran, I need to, yeah, that area there. Please. Okay. All right. He needs to mute. There we go. Thank you, Rich. I think that I just want to add one thing is that we actually felt um, a sense of success when we sent out a uh, MailChimp request for people who would be willing to share their experience. It was um, the first time we had tried uh, sort of emailing the whole group and asking 
for their involvement, their response, whatever. And we hope to do more MailChimp um, uh, mailings out about questions and in issues that we're concerned with or looking for information on or help with. So uh, be sure to open those um, emails. Judd, will they always come from tech at DCPNs? I mean, I'm trying to get people to understand that I get comments every month. I didn't get the invitation. Most of the time they're in their spam or trash. Um, so again, Judd, will you tell them what to look for when it's going to be legitimately from our group? Yes, it's always from tech at dcpn.org. And uh, that's just an address we have. It's, it's what's called an authorized address. So it's supposed to mean something to most of the mailboxes so they don't uh, suggest or account as spam mail. It's from an authorized sender. That's us. And then also the name that would appear is Peripheral Neuropathy Support Network. That's the name of the group it will come from. If it comes from Pat, it's just a personal request. Uh, it, it pretty much should always come from tech at. So. And I have found that I have had to search tech at to find some information. So if you aren't, if you think it's the day before the monthly meeting and you haven't gotten yours, please check uh, by just searching your, your mail with tech at DCPN and you will uh, dcpnsupport.org and like me, you will find it. Um, let's see, I think there, uh, Steve Klitzman was here briefly, but I don't think he's still with us. Uh, his next meeting, the Bethesda Chevy Chase uh, group will be meeting on April 21st. And I have not heard if it's a speaker or open meeting, but at least you can put that on your calendar. Six, uh, sorry, seven o'clock on April 21st. Uh, CJ Holiday has actually asked us to stop advertising his um, group meetings only because the Zoom number of participants was getting hard to manage on Zoom. So uh, if you are already involved with CJ, you will continue to get your invitation from him. But basically, he's not at this point taking uh, or asking us to ask for more members to participate because he's pretty much at uh, the top level. Is there anything else that we need to, that I've forgotten? May 7th is our next meeting. Rich will be moderating the panel and um, we are having two people, sort of ironically, two people from Pennsylvania's group, the Pittsburgh group, have asked, answered our request to participate. So they may be giving uh, their perspective on marijuana use as well as two women who will be out of town and asked me to just tell their experience. So I will be reporting that. And that's not closed. If you have any interest in um, participating and didn't say this in the past, and we're looking for positive and not so positive experiences. One person said it didn't help them at all. That's valuable to some people. And more importantly, uh, Phil is going to speak uh, on his experiences with vaping. Someone else might be talking about gummies or edibles. So it's, it's just generally speaking, we're going to explore um, cannabis use. And people have asked, why are we not having a professional uh, like the Harvard researcher, Dr. Tisler speak? We may, this may be a follow-up meeting, um, but we wanted to hear from our own community first, and then we will uh, uh, talk perhaps with Rich Davis, is, um, I guess is it your internist, Rich, who you seem to think is knowledgeable or has sort of focused on uh, cannabis use? Yes. Yeah, he's, he's familiar with the process of, uh, the dispensaries and getting licensed and that type of thing. Um, and I think, I think it was Paul, uh, another person, I don't Paul think, Sixta. Mm -hmm. yeah, Paul, who was going to talk about the vaping part. So I don't, um, uh, okay. yeah, but I think, so yeah, I think your point is that the idea is for this first panel meeting to be for kind of internal members talking about, their various experiences and issues and that type of thing. And then from that, we can look at what the interest areas are 
and maybe have a panel, a follow-up panel of, of medical experts who could more specifically address some of those topics. So I see Phil's got his hand. Yes, Phil, go ahead. Yeah, uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, I, I would also like to address, I've done a lot of research into this. You, you can't just smoke pot and, and expect to get relief. There, there are, the, the chemistry behind modern cannabis is, it's amazing. It's, it's my, actually mind blowing, literally and figuratively. Uh, there, there are particular uh, chemicals that they uh, breed into the plants, provide specific relief for pain receptors. There's specific things they breed or, or cultivate into to boost up certain things that provide just overall pain relief. Uh, I could talk about those and identify those. And, in, in, you know, as people go to the, the, I see people at the cannabis stores. I talk to the people there. Well, I'm using this. I'm using that. So, well, have you tried this? You know, it doesn't get you stoned, but it provides pain relief. Oh, no, I want the stone effect. Well, then you're not helping yourself. You know what I mean? <laughs> you you got you to use, you have to use it correctly. Use it in the way they, they intended it to be used. It's not for, it's not to get your jollies and, you know, be stoned all days. It's actually it's medication, you know, so you have to use it correctly. Um, and so I'll, I'll bring, I'll have specifics, you know, if you're interested and you're looking for that, I can give you, you know, the, the chemical elements or compounds to look for. Uh, otherwise you're, you're wasting your time. So. Okay. Thank you for that. I know that Dr. Tisler also emphasized that you really need to be working with a physician. You should not be going out on your own and, and uh, self uh, diagnosing and sure. self where, where are you going to find a doctor that's going to help you use cannabis? Tell, tell me that. I, I haven't seen one in Fredericksburg or Stafford. They well, don't exist. Supposedly in Virginia, there are designated doctors who are yeah. the ones who you're supposed to go to for the medical card. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. This is no, the May 7th no. meeting and we're coming to <laughs> a, a, a close here. But um, if this has piqued your interest, please plan on joining us on May 7th at 2 o'clock. I think it'll generate interesting discussion questions and uh, concerns. Now, if anyone has not had the chance to talk or would like to, I see Terry, welcome, and uh, a couple of others who joined a bit later. If anyone has anything that they would like to say, um, please speak up. We're happy to hear your comments. And uh, we also always emphasize that the the conversation can continue past four o'clock. The official end of the meeting is at four o'clock, but uh, I, I just want to say, and I'm sure you talked about it at the beginning. I was at the kickoff event for Dr. Gregory. I don't know how to say his last name. Ma Ma Madison. Ma Madison, I think. Matt Mess. He he's such a wonderful guy. I really enjoyed it. He has small fiber PN, and he lives in DC. And I, he's e-biking across the United States to raise awareness and funds or peripheral neuropathy in there. I don't know if you, uh, Fox 5 covered him uh, Thursday, Friday morning, Friday, like six, yep. 6 50 in the morning. <laughs> they did a, they did a interview and he was just wonderful. I don't know if we could get, yes, um, we're post, we will be posting that on our website. Um, so that they, Fox has released it. If you uh, want to know more about his journey, it's really, truly amazing. You can either go to his website, ebiketour.org and see everything, or you can watch the interview. Uh, the interview had a little bit more about um, e-bike riding and uh, his, the Dutch-American relationship and why he is doing this. He is an, a DC resident, but a Dutch right. citizen. And so, he's, also, he's also making a documentary. And I mean, I'm sure his documentary won't be done when he's finished, but I mean, he may want to interview people in our group to yeah. talk about our experiences with the end. Okay. And okay. Jessica, you've patiently been waiting. Your hand is up. You may have yeah. a last word here. Yeah, I just put, I just put my hand up. I do use medical marijuana. I'm in Pennsylvania, so it's slightly different, but I'm happy to speak about okay. my experiences. If it would help anybody at all. Thank you. We will add you to the uh, panel uh, list and Richard or I will get back with you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you. Okay. Well, I would like to again, thank Chuck and Donna, our guests today. Wonderful presentation and People like mm -hmm. Rich's wife who missed the, the photos and my sister who has traveled many of those same routes will be very interested in seeing the recording. And thankfully Judd realized that we didn't turn on the recording right at the minute, beginning. So we 
probably missed a little bit of Joanne's um, intro, but we got your full uh, uh, presentation. So okay. thank you both. And I always, I actually asked Donna to come as well because I think the caregiver support person in the, in the relationship is as important as the patient to hear from because they live the life as well as we do. So I appreciate that. Chuck? Yeah, Donna planning? does our planning. She's the planner in the family. Mm -hmm. okay. she, she organizes and get, gets it done. Well, as a fellow retired teacher, and Terry will attest, that's um, important to any uh, teacher to be organized and to plan ahead. So congratulations for using your life experiences. And thank you. We appreciate your coming. Anyone who wants to stay on and just chat, you're welcome to. And uh, see you in May. Thank, thank you, you all again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, Chuck. Thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Judd.